Hi friends. I was recently speaking with a friend about microsolidarity and he mentioned that he was interested in microsolidarity but he didn't know much about it and wanted to learn more and I sort of shared what my experience of it was in a way that he found helpful and so I thought it might be helpful to share with you too what um, my experience with microsolidarity has been and just kind of putting in my own words and the best practices that I've found so far. I'm still pretty early in using microsolidarity, but I really enjoyed it and found it beneficial. And it's just a little bit of a framework for connecting with people that is really helpful for um, having a shared language and intention around connecting and framing what's happening as we connect with others. Yeah, so uh, I heard some good things about microsolidarity and I'd been mutuals on Twitter with Rich Bartlett for uh, quite a while actually. and. Uh, so I knew about it peripherally, but it wasn't until I took the microsolidarity course last year in 2021, Rich had a specific cohort for sort of aimed not exclusively, but largely at people on Twitter, sort of in uh, the neck of the woods that I find myself in on Twitter. And uh, I was very interested in that. And so I signed up and um, that was really when my microsolidarity journey started. And um, it was... I loved that it was a very short course. I think it was, might have been two weeks actually, very short course. And I think there were like four meetings over two weeks. And that was just such a great um, time length in comparison to a lot of courses that I had taken that were much longer. And, um, you know, there's a value to doing a longer course, but two weeks was just very feasible. And I was also grateful that they gave me a scholarship to participate. And I found that very beneficial. And um, yeah, I think, the uh, content really was the most helpful thing for me, that learning the framework and the specific ideas around microsolidarity. And so that's pretty much what I'll be sharing today as well as my own experiences with it. Yeah, um, I think uh, basically the simplest way to say what microsolidarity is, is it's valuable to meet in small groups of people, um, meet in small groups and see what happens. And uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but not much more complicated than that. And if you had to boil it down to anything, it's like meet in small groups. That's it, meet in small groups. Um, the little bit that's added on top of that is um, also very helpful. And so they have some terms. Uh, one of the terms that they introduce is a crew, which is the group of small people roughly three to six people that you're meeting with. If it's two people, it's a dyad. And of course, if it's just you, that's one person. Although they point out that, uh, you know, from an internal family systems perspective, you are also uh, many people within. But um, in any case, uh, a crew is a group of three to six people that are meeting with some kind of shared purpose and intention and structure. And then they also introduce the term congregation, which is uh, a larger, group of crews. And so this is something like 30 to 150 people that have crews within that group. And those crews can arise and uh, pass away within that larger congregation as needed. And um, when you're starting a crew, it's they have this term, a caller, that's the person that creates the crew, and they have um, sort of a shared intention. And so the, the caller puts out some kind of document or other proposal of like, hey, I want to meet with these people in this format for this intention and let's let's try that out. And if people resonate with that, then they can join the crew. And uh, I found that to be a really helpful frame of like, hey, there is this person that's initiating the crew and they have this specific intention, but then they're sort of recruiting people to uh, come on board with their crew and if they resonate then that's great and then from that point it's sort of co-created what exactly the crew is because there is that sort of shared resonance of oh yeah this would be a valuable thing to do and the initiator doesn't have to be like the leader in perpetuity uh, there can be a kind of collective intelligence that takes over and runs the group instead and the caller may still have like a, a role in that but uh, it's not necessary and um yeah, and you can even switch facilitators. So even though the caller created the crew, facilitators can switch from say week to week or however often it is that you meet. And they also talk about the rhythm of meeting, like, oh, do you, we meet every week or every month or what is it, quarterly, yearly? 
Um, but the thing that I found really useful around time, this was probably one of the most useful concepts, was having um, sort of a cycle of how long the crew is supposed to last. And you have some kind of intention of, hey, when I set out this proposal for let's meet, let's meet for every week for a month, or let's meet once a month for six months. And then at the end of that, let's do a retrospective and say, what was that like for us? And how was it? And what was good? And what didn't work so well? And importantly, do we want to keep doing this or not? And having that intention for how long a group is going to last before you sort of revisit its intention and purpose and what's happening um, creates a really powerful container because it's not uh, assumed that it will last forever. It's not permanent, but it, there is like a, a time frame or horizon of, yes, we are going to meet for this purpose for this amount of time. And um, I think in particular, if, if, if a meeting is sort of supposed to last infinitely, then it's easy for individual people to drop off and be like, oh, this isn't a fit anymore. But if you have that intention of, oh, we're going to meet once a week for six weeks and see how that goes, then there, there can be a kind of momentum of like, yeah, we'll try it for the six weeks and then I might drop out after that, or we might change the thing entirely or add new people, but we're going to give this six weeks ago or, or whatever it is. Yeah, so that's just a little bit of framework, and the Microsolidarity Handbook talks about more than that, and there are specific ideas and practices that are helpful, but even just that little bit of information about crews and congregations and having a caller, having a shared intention for meeting and shared expectations, and also importantly, sort of a, a, a deadline of how long the group is going to last before you revisit its intention and purpose and whether you even want to be in it or not, um, has been really helpful. And I've started a few crews since then, uh, mostly around uh, spiritual practice, bringing that to a community that I'm in, having intentions for, oh, we're going to meet on um, this topic or that topic, and we're going to meet for this long and meet once a week, and how are we going to structure those meetings and so on. And just that little bit of framework is really helpful for connecting people in a way that's not um, too formal or too intense, but um, makes it go more smoothly and has uh, sort of shared expectations about what's happening and why and why we're doing the things that we're doing. So I found that really valuable. And I think one of the uh, main contributions that might be worth mentioning that I found in my own microsolidary practice is how this microsolidary practice, which is about synchronously meeting with people in groups, either in person or online, is complemented by asynchronous communication in the form of in the form of what you what I call feeds. This comes from a community that I'm in, um, that I've adopted this practice elsewhere and has sort of spread elsewhere as well. But this is sort of like using a tool like Slack or Discord and creating channels as feeds for specific people or discussion topics and having some intentional structure around uh, what's being discussed where and almost this form of like social journaling of if I'm in a group, I can have a feed Tashin where I discuss what's happening for me and my life and um, share things related to me in that context. And um, it's really remarkable how much community and connection can be created through these feeds in an asynchronous form with a tool like Discord and Slack if you use that structure. So I think that those two tools really complement each other well. Microsolidarity for meeting live synchronously with groups of people and then asynchronously connecting to each other through these feeds. You know, people might be in totally different time zones or parts of the world, um, but they can still learn about each other at their own pace and connect and share what's on their mind in relation to what you're meeting about. And that's just a really powerful practice. So. I've enjoyed connecting those two things, and I think microsolidarity practitioners could benefit from using feeds more often, and I think the communities that are starting to use feeds could benefit from using microsolidarity and adding just a little bit of framework for how you connect and having live meetings around shared intentions um, with just that little bit of structure. So anyway, I've really enjoyed learning about microsolidarity and appreciate Rich and Nati for uh, sharing that and other people that have contributed to that. And it's a really beautiful practice and uh, I've been happy to learn about it and happy to practice it and I'm grateful it exists. So wanted to share a little bit about my own learnings with it with you. So thanks for watching.